Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. Hebrews chapter 11, lift your Bible in the air, say it with me, like you mean it, from your heart. Say this from your heart, not, a, not something you've memorized, not something you just spit out. Say it from your heart. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible word. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. My mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I hope you can memorize that verse. Father, I pray that you'll bring this verse home to us today. God, every, every person within the sanctuary, every family, every home is in a different situation. There are no two of us alike here today. There are no two of us dealing with the same things. But God, you know what's going on. You know what's going on in our life. You know what's going on with us personally. You know what's going on with us as a church corporately. You know what's going on with us as families. And God, I pray that your word will speak to that today. God, we're not just here this morning to get from you. Father, so often we pray for your presence to come into the church so we can be blessed and we can be touched and we can be all these things. But God, sometimes we forget when we come here, we're first to come here to bless you. We're here to honor you. We're, God, we're here to worship you. We're here to, to surrender ourselves to you. And that's first. That is primary. But Father, as we do that today, bring us tighter in. Bring us in closer. And God, help us to learn the things that we need to learn to become better Christian people, to become better examples. God, to be strong in our faith, especially in those most trying times. Father, we thank you for the work that you've already begun here today and the work that you're going to finish by the time his service is over. In Jesus' name, amen. A popular apologist and evangelist recently told his audience that the reason that he is a Christian and the compelling reason that they should be a Christian too is because Christianity works. This is a dangerous proposition. To accept Jesus Christ as our Savior so we will have a better life leaves an open door and an easy out for many to abandon the faith when God seems to fail to deliver on his promises. Popular books and speakers are delivering this message every day. Splashed across TV screens and across the shelves of Christian bookstores are messages and titles that are far from subtle. Book titles like Your Best Life Now, The Power of I Am, Breaking Free, Jesus Calling, Power Thoughts, Destined to Reign. These books exist because of the audience' insatiable appetite for a cheap grace theology, for a faith that works for them, but not necessarily for God. The Apostle Paul predicted this would happen. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul warned, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We have, in fact, raised up teachers to suit our own passions, and there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, following their words. But I want you to know this morning, church, that I'm not a Christian today because Christianity works. God has been good to me in my life. But that conclusion comes mainly out of biblical conviction and not always out of personal experience. Determining what God is like based on my own experiences would sometimes make me doubt God's love and His care. I believe that God is good. 
Because the Bible says that he's good, not because he's bailed me out every time I've been in trouble. I believe that God is love because the Bible says that he is love and he loves me all of the time, even the times when I don't feel like I'm loved at all. I believe that God is faithful. And he'll never leave me or forsake me, but not because my life is easy and pain-free, but because his word says that he is. I can't tell you that God has shown himself to be good to me during the hard times in my life. Sometimes when life has been hard, I haven't felt his presence. Sometimes when I need him, God seems absent. Can I be real with you? Would you allow me that? Can I be honest with you this morning? Can I tell you my heart? Do you want me to be uh, just a, a plastic pastor that you can pull out every week and set on the shelf? Or do you want me to be a real person? What brings me through those dark moments in my life isn't some great miracle that suddenly solves all of my problems, but it is a mature faith and trust in what I know to be true about God from the Scriptures. Sometimes the only evidence that we have is the Word of God. Sometimes the only assurance that we have is our Bible. When we think that God isn't near and He isn't listening, we need to be wise enough to open our Bible and allow God to connect with us and speak to us and assure us that in spite of what we see and in spite of what we hear and in spite of what we feel, He is still everything that the Scriptures tell us He is. The Holy Spirit confirms these truths during our pain. During our pain. I heard somebody say the other day, when you pray to God and you ask Him for patience, does He give you patience or does He give you the opportunity to show patience? When you pray and ask God to bring your family together, does He just bring it together or does He give you an opportunity for it to come together? The Holy Spirit concerns these truths of the Scriptures during our pain as reminders of what is true of Him, but not necessarily providing relief in the moment. And those moments can be anguishing and tormenting. Where's God when I hurt? It's an all-too-real question that most of us ask when we're in the valley. Those are the times when we could easily conclude that Christianity isn't working. But because of God's infallible, incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed, we have hope. Because God's Word says, and we know. And we know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that we cannot see. I could probably close my message right there. But I won't. There's some people who say that they aren't a Christian today because Christianity wasn't as advertised. It didn't work for them. They didn't see miracles. They never experienced the answer prayer. Their life never improved. So they just gave up on Christianity and they moved on to the next thing. Have you ever asked yourself, why doesn't Christianity work for me? I attend church, at least occasionally. I say my prayers sometimes. I've read the Bible occasionally, and I've heard the stories. I've heard about Moses parting the Red Sea and Joshua making the sun stand still and making the walls of Jericho fall down. I've read about Elijah calling fire down from heaven, and I've heard about the disciples and the great things that they could do. So why doesn't Christianity work that way for me? So many people think that when they become a Christian that they should be able to instantly do and receive the things that they've read about in the Bible. They want to go from being Joe the sinner to Elijah the great. But it doesn't quite seem to work out that way. Sometimes we get angry with God, disenchanted with Christianity and disappointed in the church when life doesn't go according to our plan. In difficult times, we ask God for his help. We want him to heal our sickness or to provide for our need or to come to our rescue, but God doesn't seem to answer our request. The sickness gets worse, the budget goes south, and the trouble multiplies. So what do we do? We grumble. Well, God must not be who he says he is. God doesn't answer prayer like he's supposed to. What good is a God that doesn't help me when I need him? But if you're being honest, you'll have to admit that what you are really saying is, what good is a God that doesn't meet my demands? There are two scenarios at work here. Not one, but two. 
And if you feel that Christianity isn't working for you, then you need to figure out today which one of these two scenarios is you. Some of you consider yourself to be a Christian, but you think that you can live as you please. Going through life serving your own lust and your own pleasure without any thought of God in his kingdom. But because you claim to be a Christian, you still expect God to act like God for you when you need him to be. So when there's trouble that you can't handle on your own, and there's something going on in your life that's too big or too hard for you to solve, you cry out to God. You drop to your knees with tears in your eyes, and you beg God to fix your problem. But God doesn't respond. You want something, so you ask God for it in Jesus' name. After all, God's supposed to meet all of your needs and give you the desires of your heart, and he can't resist you when you ask for it in Jesus' name. But God doesn't deliver on your request. And then on top of all of that, life hits. It's not a big thing, but it's a whole bunch of little things. You're working on one thing, and another thing breaks. You pay one bill, and two more come in the mail. So you turn to God and you ask Him for relief, but those little things keep coming. So you get frustrated. And you begin to complain. You get angry with God. You growl about the church. You get mad at the preacher. You think that everybody is a hypocrite because you're convinced that God has failed you and Christianity doesn't work. Am I talking to anybody? But deep down in your heart of hearts, you know that the problem isn't with God, but the problem is with you. You've refused to walk with God. You've refused to live your life in submission to Him. You don't love Him, you don't serve Him, but you have been defiant and rebellious, and you know it. But here's what I want you to understand. God wants to bless you. He really does. He, he, but He can't bless you where you are. He wants to answer your prayers and be as big in your life as He has been in the lives of those you've read about in the Bible. But God... God wants to help you, and he wants to comfort you, and he wants to protect you, but you're out of range. You've wondered. You might not have wanted it to go so far out of hand. You might not have wanted it to get so far away. You might not have intended to go in so deep, but you've wondered. You've wandered far away from God's protection and provision. Like the prodigal son, you're living your life outside of the father's hedge. Now you're nowhere you're not where you should be, and your actions have tied God's hands, so instead of blessings, you have curses, and instead of joy, you have sorrow. When the prodigal son left his father's home, he left the boundaries of his father's protection and his father's provision. His father couldn't feed him or care for him because he was living outside of his father's kingdom. His father couldn't protect him because he was living outside of his father's hedge. Now, I know what you're going to say here. Well, if God is love, if he, if he really cared, he would do it anyway. If that father really loved his son, he wouldn't have abandoned him. He would still would have been there to take care of his son, so he wouldn't have to suffer like he did. Listen real close here. When you run away from God, when you rebel and thumb your nose at the Heavenly Father, when you purposely and defiantly choose to live in sin, but you still think you can call home when you need help, and Daddy will come running to bail you out. When you refuse to submit your life fully to God and live in His will, but instead you choose to be defiant and you choose to be rebellious, God isn't going to pay your bill. It was the hedge that set the parameters of the Father's care. It was the hedge that kept the enemy away from his son. It was the hedge that kept his son near enough to his father that his father could hear his voice and he could meet his needs. But when that boy stepped out of his father's hedge, he became vulnerable. He became easy prey for the enemy. Christianity does work. Prayers are always answered. God always hears and he always cares and he's always as good as his word. You might not get him what you've asked God for, but there hasn't been a glitch in the system. God's not ignoring you. He hasn't stopped caring about you. But your Heavenly Father knows where you are, and He knows what you're doing even when you claim to be doing something else. God knows what you're dealing with and what you're going through. Heaven is still heaven. God is still on His throne. But you are up to your neck in trouble because you have left your Father's hedge, and Christianity is not working for you. If that's you, the very first thing you need to do is own your situation. It's not God's fault. It's not mom and dad's fault. It's not your husband's fault or your wife's fault or your friend's fault. But you are where you are because of the choices that you have made. 
The prodigal son said, I have sinned. I have sinned. I am the only one to blame. I am where I am because of me. Own your situation. The second thing that he did was repent. The prodigal son said, I need to go home. I need to put all of this mess behind me. I need to leave this life behind me, and I need to return to my father. That's what repentance is. Repentance isn't just admitting that you've been wrong and then asking God to forgive you, but it is then putting your sin behind you and coming home to God. God wants to be God in your life, but he can't be God in your life until you come home. That was the first scenario. The second scenario is this. You've given your life to God. You love Jesus with all of your heart, but you still need to grow up. Ephesians 4, 13 to 15 says, Until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Back in 2009, I preached a message that said you can't expect great things from God if you're still living a small faith life. Anybody remember that? Yeah, Tom, you didn't remember what you ate yesterday. What are you talking about? Before we can ever talk about God doing great things in our life, we need to talk about the little things that God expects from us. Before we ex- talk about great faith, we have to talk about small faith. You see, if you haven't mastered the small faith stuff, you're nowhere near ready to hear about great faith. If you haven't mastered the little things, you're not going to be able to deal with the big things. So we won't even attempt to handle the great faith agenda until we've conquered the fa- small faith stuff. Unfortunately, this is where many professing Christians choose to live. I was watching that video thinking, uh, I wonder how many people out here are doing a lot more for the kingdom of God than we are. Many people who say that they're Christians still struggle with small things. Oh, it's so hard for me to get up and come to church. Sunday school just starts way too early for me to get there. It's hard for me to find alone time to read my Bible and pray every day because I am just so busy. I can't afford to tithe because I have too many important things to pay for. You're still struggling with the small stuff. I can't imagine Moses saying, God, I'd lead your people to the promised land, but it is way too far to walk. Or Joshua was saying, you know, I'll march around Jericho once, but seven times just seems fanatical to me. Can you imagine one of the disciples telling Jesus, I'm not going to the temple today. I think I'm going to sleep in. Or how I'm having people over this afternoon, so I'm just going to stay at home and cook. Can you imagine? You're not going to move on to parting the Red Sea and making the sun stand still if you can't even handle the little things. Maturing in your faith comes from doing the small things. Somebody once said, luck happens when preparation meets with opportunity. If you're a football fan like me, nearly every week you'll see an amazing play. I want you to know my football's been narrowed down to one day a week now because of the stupidity of our professionals, but I like watching football. You'll see a receiver leap into the air. He'll tip a football around on his fingertip, bounce it off of his elbow, and then he'll haul it in and run for a touchdown. And somebody will, ne- it will inevitably say, well, he made a lucky catch. Oh, no. Any good fan that has at least a little bit of football savvy knows that luck happens when preparation meets with opportunity. That wasn't the first football that receiver ever caught. It's not the first one that was out of his reach, but he spent hours and hours practicing for that very moment. He practiced what's called a tip drill every day. He prepared for the moment when the game was on the line and that catch meant the difference between winning and losing. He made that spectacular catch because he prepared himself to make it. I want you to know that I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in fortune. I don't believe in karma. I don't believe in the alignment of the planets and stars. But I, and I don't believe in fate, but I do believe in God. And I'm convinced that the great power of God comes upon a Christian life when preparation meets with opportunity. 
anyone who's had any measure of success <coughs> in any field will tell you that the root of their achievement and the foundation of their success was the mastering of the fundamentals. There are four fundamentals that I want to talk about this morning that are primary in a faith-based Christian life. There are four things that are basic to the growth of your faith. There are four things that will set you up for answered prayer, that will open doors for miracles, that will keep you safe from the enemy, that will see you through any trouble, and will allow God to show himself as the great I am in your life. The very first is reading and studying the Bible. How can we have a great faith in God if we don't know what God has said? Through prayer we speak to God, but it's through his word that God speaks to us. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. The trouble with many Christians today is they are either too busy or they are too lazy to read their Bible. I like what we're doing in some of our, in our small groups around here. You, The every man a warrior, you got to read every day. You have to read every day. And you read every day. And, and how many of you guys that are in, how many of you guys are in that? How many guys will honestly say that reading every day has done something for you? Great. You see, most of us live in the excuses. We're either too busy or we're too lazy to read our Bible. We want the Bible. They want the effects of the Bible. They want the influence of the Bible. They want the power of the Bible, and they want to roughly quote the Bible, but they don't want to read the Bible. Sometimes when I read people's comments on Facebook, I, I just want to say, do you read the Bible? Did you just use it to slap people around? What do they do? They look for a shortcut. They'll follow tradition. Well, this is what our church believes. Your church might believe different, but the Bible can be interpreted in many different ways. Anybody who tells you that the Bible can be interpreted in many different ways is somebody who hasn't read the Bible Tradition is leading a lot of people right straight into hell. They look for a shortcut. So instead of reading their Bible, they listen to a TV preacher. Or they buy somebody's book, or they watch a Christian movie. Or even worse, they will imagine that the Holy Spirit is speaking to them. I'll tell you what, God, I don't have time to read the Bible, so why don't you just walk along beside me and talk in my ear? They come up with things like, well, God told me. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. What God wants to tell you, he has already told you. That's why Jesus said time and time again, it is written or have you not read. You can't have great faith in your life if you don't know the book. It's the word of God that makes demons flee. It's the word of God that parts seas and makes the sun stand still. It's the word of God that makes walls tumble and brings death to life. We can't expect to have great faith and great power if we don't know the Bible. So study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing God's word of truth. There is no shortcut. Second of all is prayer. The key to any good relationship is communication. You can't have intimacy if you don't, with God if you don't talk to God and then listen to him. We're pretty good at the talking part, but we really stink at the listening part. Most of our conversations with God are one-sided. We do all of the talking and then we... Hang up. I miss my mom with all my heart. And I can't wait for the day when I can talk to her again. She was the greatest Christian woman I've ever known, and I knew her thoroughly. <laughs> but when my mom got up in years, she developed this habit when she was talking on the phone. She didn't hear real well, but if she called you on the phone, <laughs> that didn't matter because she wasn't going to listen. <laughs> she called you on the phone to talk. You always knew when the conversation was over with mom because my mom would just hang up. Jim, yeah, I need you to come over and fix the TV remote. Well, mom, I can click. Hello? Huh. We were done talking. The most important aspect of communication isn't speaking, it's listening. Now, I'll give some time for husbands and wives to poke each other in the ribs there. I'm safely a couple of rows away. <laughs> One of the only things that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them was about prayer. 
They noticed what prayer did in Jesus' life. Before every critical moment, before every confrontation, before every crisis, Jesus prayed. And then he would get up from the earth and he would heal sicknesses and cast out demons and make blind eyes seize and deaf ears hear. And the disciples said, we got to get some of that. We need to know how that works. So they said to Jesus, teach us how to pray. If you only call on God when you're in trouble, if you only enter into the throne room when you have a request or you have a demand, then you're missing the greatest advantage of prayer. Prayer builds your relationship with God. Prayer creates a bond. God becomes more than just a policeman or a banker or a doctor. It's through communicating with God through prayer that you begin to understand that God is your father and you are his child. A bond is created and a relationship is built in prayer that can't be built any other way. You wonder why you don't feel close to God? You don't pray. The third is church attendance. Well, yeah, you're a pastor out here, you would say that. You're doggone right, I would. The fellowship with other believers adds to your strength and your faith. Luke 4, 16 says, As Jesus' habit was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. What would Jesus do? <laughs> I'll tell you what Jesus would do. He knew the word, he prayed, and he went to church. That's what Jesus did. The church has always been central to the worship of God. By the hand of God, the tabernacle was created in the Old Testament as a place where God could meet with his people. When Israel came into their own land, a temple was built as a permanent place of communion where heaven touched the earth. The acts of the apostles were the planting of churches where God could meet with his people and where his people could meet with each other. And none of that has ever changed. There's some who will say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. These, by the way, are the same people who don't read their Bible. A great barometer of the strength of your faith and the quality of your relationship with Jesus, a great barometer of your spiritual maturity is your church attendance record. I did a study on how many services we have here throughout the course of one year. I found that there are nearly 100 Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday evening services, not to mention our special programs, our Bible school, and, and those things. But just by using the 100 figure, I wonder how many of the hundred did you attend? If God graded our relationship with him based on our church attendance, I fear that the majority of those who profess to be a Christian would be flunking Christianity. Luke 4.16 says, As Jesus' habit was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Jesus had the habit of going to church. When God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle in the wilderness, he set it in the middle of his people. And then he instructed everybody to have the door of their tent face the tabernacle so that every new day, the very first thing that they would see was the church and the presence of God that was in the midst of them. God's church isn't at the center of our lives anymore. We see that, uh, that attending a good Bible preaching church is important to us, but our actions speak louder than our words. We want to hold a membership, we want to carry a name or belong to an association, but we would be in real trouble if we had to approve it, to prove it by our attendance record. We sing Jesus be the center of it all. But instead of being centered on Jesus, we've centered our life around other things. We've centered our life around our job. Well, pastor, good jobs are hard to find and I have to make a living for my family. Yes, you do. But a good church is even more difficult to find. But you'll uproot your family for a job with the attitude, well, I'll just find another church. And then years down the road, when you have plenty of money, but your kids and your grandkids don't know the Lord, you're going to be overcome with guilt, and deservedly so. The church isn't at the center of our lives anymore. Other things have taken its place. Sports, school activities, politics are more important to us, and it's evident by the amount of time that we commit to them compared to the time we have committed to God's church. You give a coach three or four hours of your child's time every day and think nothing of it, but you won't give them to your youth pastor for an hour and 15 minutes on Wednesday night or for an hour on Sunday night. And then when they graduate from high school and they choose not to live for God and they refuse to come to church, you wonder why. 
If Jesus had the habit of going to church, then why don't we? Why don't we? Number four is ministry. Faith has to be put to practice to become strong. As our muscles are vindictive, so is our faith. If we don't use our faith, we're going to lose it. It's by the work of the ministry that our faith is made strong. You show me a weak, anemic Christian, and I'll show you somebody who has no ministry. Show me a Christian who is frail and failing, and I'll show you somebody who doesn't have a ministry. Your ministry is the outlet for your faith. It's where you apply what you've learned and where you burn off what God feeds you. God doesn't feed you and fill you to make you fat. He fills you so you can go out and do ministry. Have you ever wondered what kind of church we would have if everybody pitched in and did ministry? If instead of seeking people out and begging them to get involved, we had people lined up looking for something to do, what could we accomplish for God's kingdom? A good friend of mine here in the church just gave his life to Jesus a couple of Sundays ago. After church one Sunday night, he said to me, I just can't do enough. You're every pastor's dream. What kind of church would we have if everybody just couldn't do enough? What difference could we make in this world if God's people just couldn't do enough? Some of you haven't been Christians for very long, and I want you to understand that God doesn't expect a young Christian to move mountains or part seas. He won't tell you to walk on water or to call forth the dead, but God will start you off with the simple things. God will feed you the milk of his word, the sweet savor of truths that you've never known. He'll spoon feed you baby food that will help you grow, nuggets of life that will build you up. He'll teach you how to communicate with him. He'll teach you how to pray, and then once you know how to pray, he'll teach you how to listen for God's voice. He'll create a bond with you that will make you feel safe and secure. He'll teach you how to roll over and face a new direction in your life. He'll turn your life completely around. And then he'll teach you how to crawl and how to make progress in your life so you can get to places where you've never been and achieve things that you never thought that you could attain. He'll then lift you up and show you how to take baby sex so you can progress more efficiently. And before you know it, you'll be walking just like Jesus walked. But if you refuse to eat, and you refuse to listen to his voice, if you don't move when he asks you to, and you refuse to stand when he asks you to walk, you can't expect the great power of God in your life. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor, neither of those scenarios apply to me. I'm not a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, and I have been a Christian and faithful to God for 20 years. So how does this apply to me? You're faithful. You live your life always trying to please the Lord. You're mature in your faith. But this morning, you're tired and you're worn, and you feel like giving up. Christianity doesn't seem to be working for you. This is God's word for you. In the middle of whatever you're in the middle of, open God's word and let him remind you that even in the midst of the most difficult times in your life, God is everything that he says he is, and he will do everything he says he will do. God is still on his throne. He still answers prayer, and he still performs miracles. God still protects and provides, but that's not why I serve him today. I came to Jesus, and I serve him, not because Christianity works, but because of the hope that Jesus offers. It's the hope of my salvation. I'm a Christian because Jesus found me while I was dead in my transgressions and my sins. And he made me alive in Christ. Salvation offers me hope because it rests on a sure promise by a very dependable and faithful God who did a very certain thing for me and for you. We have a promise that one day Jesus will finally rescue us from this hard life lived out in this tormented world where a lot of bad stuff happens equally to those who love Jesus and those who don't. I want you to know my best life isn't now. It's still to come. There's a mansion on a street of gold. 
And that mansion is surrounded by the people that I love and I miss. And it sits in the presence of my Savior and Lord. And one day, it'll all be mine. And I'll leave every bad thing behind me. But in the meantime, I will keep on trusting and I'll keep on serving. 2 Corinthians 5, 2 says, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. I'm a Christian today because my sins have been forgiven. And I've been reconciled to God my King. One day he promises to establish his reign in a new and perfect heaven and earth when we finally see him face to face. And you know what? That works for me. Father, I pray today that whatever situation we're in, God, whatever scenario it is, God, whether we need to repent and come home, or whether we just need to grow up a little bit more, or God, maybe some sage old Christians just need to open the Bible one more time, and remember what you've said. Father, I pray that today, that wherever we are, whatever we're dealing with, that this word will come alive in us this morning. That it'll stir us, that it'll move us. And God, you use it to make us into the people we need to be. Father, anoint this time of invitation. Bind Satan and remove him from here. God, take complete freedom in what goes on in these next few moments. In Jesus. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God or to receive a copy of Reverend James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419. 419- 596-3103 or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.